Welcome everybody to the Big Brain Relax and Learn Episode 2 Electric Boogaloo. We are talking today about radicalization of terrorists. Continuation of our discussion from last video on the definition of terrorism. If you haven't watched that, go watch that. And then, then come back here and watch this video about how people become terrorists, right? And we're talking about the process of radicalization. Uh, if you want to learn about that, you want to learn about how uh, the theory surrounding radicalization and the different types of terrorism that people can fit into. We're going to talk about that today on Big Brain while I play XCOM 2. Let's get our class handed to us. We're going to talk about three topics with regard to radicalization. First of all, why it's difficult to apply theories of criminology to terrorists. There's a couple key differences that we're going to be talking about. Second, we're going to talk about the major theories surrounding radicalization. Surprise, there are three of them. And third, we are going to finally talk about the three general types of terrorism that you are want to see out in the field and the different ways that, you know, we kind of have to respond to them as a society. First of all, we're going to look at our soldiers here. And uh, these now these soldiers, right, again, we're terrorists, according to the Advent. But what gets us to become terrorists? Generally speaking, when it comes to explaining deviant behavior, this is where one would look into the field of criminology. Applying criminology to terrorists is a little bit different than applying it to regular criminals. So why is it difficult to apply criminological theories to terrorists? Well, criminals and terrorists are, are slightly different. First of all, criminals are generally unfocused, right? According to Batman, criminals are a superstitious and cowardly lot, uh, and are motivated strictly by, you know, monetary gain or some sort of, like, incentive. Whereas terrorists have a focus. They know what they're going to achieve. And really, if you compare that to the soldiers, any of the, the soldiers in our list here, right? Johanna, Johanna Baker, or ba Baker, Baker, it's French, so um, Bacher, I don't know. <laughs> she wouldn't be considered a criminal because she's focused in her mission, right? Her mission is to remove the advent from power. That is one of the differences between criminals and terrorists. Another one, criminals may live in the criminal underworld, but are not devoted to crime as a philosophy, whereas terrorists generally are devoted to their mission. A criminal, it's not like, oh, crime is all I live for. I must commit crime, otherwise I die. No, they're not religious zealots or anything like that, and crime is their religion. Money, maybe. Money may be their religion, but for terrorists, their mission is what they live, right? All they're going, and they devote their life to it, and if they die to achieve it, that's okay, because, they, you know, it's, it's a cause worth fighting for to them. A couple other interesting little differences. When confronted with force, criminals will tend to run. Terrorists will dive right in. Criminals impulsive and act sometimes on a whim. Terrorists, they plan everything, right? So generally speaking, criminals, terrorists, very different. All right, so the, cr the criminological theories that you would have to why somebody commits crime isn't necessarily going to attach to why somebody becomes a terrorist. Instead, we have to have our own theories as to why that is. Which brings us to point two. What are the theories of radicalization? Now, first of all, I should preface this with uh, the term radicalization is a bit of a loaded one. You hear it and you think, I mean, there's probably stereotypes that pop in your head. And radicalization is at best misunderstood. So that's why we're going to talk about a couple theories with regards to radicalization. And they, they share some common threads, but are kind of different. But first of all, what we have to talk about is the general kind of structure of radicalization is that it usually comes in three phases. The first phase being a person must decide that force is okay to be used to achieve some sort of ideal. That's phase one. Phase two is any time after that initial use of force, they are faced with using force again. They need to continue to make that decision. Is this something that I'm willing to fight for? And then the third phase is, uh, and not everybody reaches the third phase, right? Saying that there were three phases kind of makes it seem like, well, everybody goes through these three phases. The third phase is some people reach a point where the force is no longer justifiable. Have you noticed that our caps have actually got little pictures of skulls on them? Are we the baddies? And it's at that where the process of radicalization has kind of run its path. 
right? And some would say it's like you either die a hero or live to see your, live long enough to see yourself become the villain. It's kind of like you either die a terrorist or live long enough to see yourself kind of like convert. We've already encountered phase one in the last episode, our initial use of force. Phase two, we are faced with use of force again, right? And we must make the decision, do we want to continue down this path of violence in order to achieve a political objective. And this time it is Operation War Mother, hack the hidden resistance computer. Not necessarily force, but it is, we're gonna be using force because we'll probably have to kill some people. So that's kind of the general structure, is utilizing those three phases. But there are more specific theories that we can talk about. Launch that mission. So the first radicalization theory that I would like to talk about is one that was developed by a man named Mark Sageman, who studied Again, we have to put an asterisk next to this theory. Mark Sageman studied Islamic extremism, all right? So when he developed his theory, it really took a focus on religious ideals. However, that being said, it is something that we can just, with a little bit of tweaking, expand to more general, even, you know, secular terrorists as well, all right? And he has a six-step radicalization process, and it all starts with an alienated young man, right? Um, first tweak here is it could just be an, an alienated young person. It doesn't need to be a man, right? But again, with Islamic extremism, it was usually males. Take that alienated young man, and by alienated, somebody who is kind of like outcast from society. Now, how we can apply it to our group here is these people are probably not necessarily alienated, so this doesn't necessarily apply to our group here. Another theory, man, we'll get to that in a second. We take an alienated young man, somebody who may be ostracized or excluded from society, and that person meets another alienated young man or a group of alienated individuals. One guy tells another guy something, and then he tells two friends, and they tell two friends, and they tell their friends, and so on, and so on, and so on. Uh, let's send um, Mr. Sniper up and over. Pitter patter. Let's get at her. Pitter patter. Ironically, XCOM soldiers are alienated because they aren't aliens. It's true. <laughs> alienated young man meets a group of alienated young men and they continue hanging out, right? You can actually see this happen online as well in some Reddit subreddits. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to name any specifically, but you probably have seen them or at least, and, and some that have like made the news. That group starts gravitating towards a shared ideal. Now, Sageman said that it was a religion. It had to be a religion, but it doesn't really necessarily have to be a religion. Um, it's just, it's gra they gravitate towards a shared ideal. As a group of friends or group of guys is wont to do, however, they continue to attempt to outdo each other in their zealotry for that ideal. And they start interpreting that ideal in militant terms. Most groups stop at that kind of militant uh, interpretation of their ideal. However, in some instances, those groups meet a contact, a terrorist contact, of a group that shares that ideal, and they then get recruited in that group. That's Sageman's process of radicalization. Alienated young men who meet together start interpreting radical ideologies, uh, meet a contact, and then get recruited into a terrorist organization. That's Sageman's. Theory. Let's move our guys here and then we'll talk about the King and Taylor theory. One eternity later. Michael King and Donald Taylor developed an alternative theory to Mark Sageman. Mark and Taylor actually have three different models of radicalization. However, all three models can be sort of generally interpreted in one shared fashion. All three of them essentially revolve around the fact that you have a group that is being deprived of something from a more powerful group, whether it's a government, whether it's some sort of authoritarian regime, whether it is um, a majority ethnic or racial or idealistic group in a country. They can be deprived economic benefits, they can be deprived social, like socioeconomic status benefits, like climbing the rungs of society. And that group, those groups that are being deprived, eventually reach a tipping point where they no longer feel as if they can kind of live under the boot heel and must do something about it. And it is in these instances 
that our group here probably fits. Our group fits the Taylor King model fairly well. We're going to have, have you come and breach this way. Please don't get exposed. Please don't. Got it covered. Please don't. 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 We're okay. And then you are going to back this guy up. Moving to position. Oh, I can hack it from here? Attempt to breach security in a workstation with the government. Yeah, let's do that. Let's Welcome fucking do it. Begin hack. Oh, we didn't get the large supply cache. Oh, well. So, mission success, I guess? Oh, son of a bitch. Oh, now they know we're here. I see. I see how this works. My disappointment is immeasurable. And my day is ruined. Actually, first, you got hit. So we're going to give you a little bit of uh, revenge. All right, so that was the Taylor and King model. And finally, there's one more There's one more model, or there's one more theory that we need to talk about, and that is the groupthink theory. And groupthink is sort of like a Sageman theory. However, it also is, I mean, it's just groupthink. And groupthink is, is an interesting psychological concept. Ooh, he's on fire. <laughs> This guy didn't get hit at all? Fuck, man. You should do is move here. And then you should kill him. Yeah. Rock apparently does beat grenade, and I don't like that. You have a shot. A good sir. And this guy, 72% chance. If you miss, I swear, that would be three shots at this. Yes. Feels good. Oh, look at these guys. Our group think. <laughs> I have to get back on track. A group is pressured from external political, economic, and social forces. That group is then isolated from interpretations of reality. Group members develop and think like, believe that the leader's biases are factual and normal, and then a lack of structured decision-making processes ensues. That would actually probably be these people. Now, I understand that we're talking about terrorists, and you know, these are just civilians. But take a group of people, pressured from external forces, the advent, alright, the aliens, these guys. I feel like you have a much better shot than you're letting on. But we're gonna move you up, and now you have a 98, and you're just gonna blast this guy. Thank you. <laughs> Soldiers wounded, God damn it! Not a perfect mission again. So you take a group of people, though, external forces applied by the advent, right? Um, they are isolated from reality uh, in the sense that they are literally separated from information. That group member, after getting together, uh, live together in sort of like a bubble, uh, an echo chamber, if you will. Again, some, some Reddit communities are like this. They start believing that everything that their leader says is factual and normal, no matter what he says. I said he specifically. If you know, you know. They start making illogical decisions together. And that's what groupthink is. Now, finally, we're going to talk about the three different types of terrorism that this can result in. Uh, the first is very easy. Lone wolf terrorism. Lone wolf terrorism is one person who just goes and commits a terrorist attack all by himself. They are not linked to any sort of group. I want to get that one out of the way because it's not really what we're talking about. But lone wolf terrorism is horrifying and it's really hard to track. Because the person is usually self-taught their ideal or ideology, and sometimes as a result of psychosis, uh, and their attack is very well planned, but only to themselves. There is no way to, to see it happening until it's right about to occur. Um, and the best way to fight it is actually just community-based policing. But the two more interesting types of terrorism, and the two types of terrorism that are more most relevant to the game here today, is small group and urban terrorism, which is what we've been engaged in primarily and then guerrilla and large group terrorism. Small group terrorism. The tactics of which have been developed by two primary individuals, France Fanon of Algeria and Carlos Maragueya of Brazil. Of Carlos Maragueya actually wrote the book on small group terrorism, and it's called The Mini Manual of the Urban Guerrilla, and it's basically a how-to manual of how to be a terrorist. Um, and interestingly enough, what we're doing in the game kind of follows along the mini manual. What he says is that for a small group of guerrilla fighters to be able to achieve true revolution and change, 
they must engage in urban chaos, essentially. Go through urban uh, urban centers and attack targets whenever the chance arises. Uh, the first mission was blowing up a was blowing up a statue. So this one was, oh, we needed to hack into this thing and then kill the people. That's that urban kind of chaos. Simultaneously, alongside that, however, you will also have a group running sort of psychological warfare, trying to justify the actions of the violent terrorists. Eventually, Carlos Maragueya believes that what those actions will result in is a crackdown by the government in power that will essentially force the government to show its true face. What XCOM is trying to do is get the advent to show its true face, right? And for those of you that know, uh, the, you know, the, the true face is that they're, they're, they're shitty aliens who want to, like, alter the gene pool and change, you know, change the, the, the peoples into them and, and take us and it's an authoritarian regime and crack down and you know remove civil liberties and remove rights and and you know bring in the national guard and all that so now i can actually build something and i think what we're going to guerrilla tactics school guerrilla warfare uh we'll unlock additional skills and benefit including an increase in the number of soldiers we can take on a single mission that would be great once the government in power shows their hand Carlos Marquez says that the public would then turn to the terrorists, or freedom fighters as he called them, um, who would accept them with loving arms, open arms, saying, see, we told you they were bad, we just needed to show you. Franz Fanon, who, who lived before Carlos Marquez, um, puts a little kind of like addendum to this that says the, the chaos driven by the urban terrorists cannot target potential supporters. It needs to target the regime and supporters of the regime. Any natives who are just kind of like victims cannot be targeted because those are the ones that you're going to need to support in order to, you know, spur a revolution. And then finally, there is large group terrorism, which is sort of, no, nah, it's, yeah, it's sort of what we're attempting to do here. So this is actually perfectly timed. <laughs> Meant to do it first try. What we were just told is that we need to get into the alien black site to prove to see what they're going to be doing. But we need to get in contact with other resistance groups throughout the world. This is large group terrorism as defined by the one and only Che Guevara, um, who fought in the Cuban Revolution alongside Fidel Castro. Che Guevara wrote again a how-to manual, um, except his was uh, more so a how we did it. Right. It, as opposed to being a how-to, it was kind of like a, this is how we completed our revolution. It was actually entitled Reminiscences of the Cuban Revolution. Now, I mentioned these two books. Che Guevara actually achieved his objective uh, and then, you know, was betrayed by Fidel Castro and murdered. Curse your sudden but inevitable betrayal. Ah, ah, ah. Mine is an evil laugh. Now die! Carlos Maragueya wrote a how-to manual. Uh, the problem with his how-to manual is that it has never worked. <laughs> it's actually never achieved a full-blown revolution. Che Guevara has, though. And his, um, he changes tack. Maragueya believed that urban centers were the key. Che said, no, 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 the rural is the key. You start on the periphery. You start in rural areas, and you, again, chaos. Use individual separate little forces like like here in XCOM right there are individual resistance groups out doing their own thing what you want though is those resistance groups to start combining forces and form into what were what he deemed large columns and those columns would then be bigger stronger have more resources and slowly move towards the more densely packed urban centers and once you had enough columns, and once they were close enough to the urban centers, they would then be able to fight a full-on assault, toe-to-toe, -to -toe, with the regime in power. That worked. That's how the Cuban Revolution happened. Um, they started out in the rural areas, much like we are, doing small little attacks, gaining support along the way, and eventually contacting other resistance movements, and those resistance movements joined forces to then take on the larger force altogether. That's large group terrorism. That can only really be fought by a military. Um, lone wolf terrorism, as we talked about, has to be, uh, needs to be targeted by local police. And small group 
can kind of be a mix, mix mash of both. Have have the military National Guard, but also have like you know uh, the police help with that too, because it's focused in those urban centers. But now, you know all you need to know about radicalization and the process through which people become and can become terrorists uh, and the three different types of terrorism that they can then jump into. If you like this sort of thorough discussion, please consider subscribing to the channel, giving a like, maybe throwing a comment in there. We also do these lessons every Monday night over at twitch.tv slash So make sure to follow over there. Once again, thank you for joining me on the big brain. I am your professor, FP Eskra, class dismissed.